Exodus chapter 24, notice verse 3. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people a answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said will we do. Let me give you a little bit of a background here. If you remember, they were redeemed out of Egyptian bondage in Exodus chapter 12. They crossed through the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 15 is the song of Moses. And from Exodus 15 to Exodus 19 is their journey to Mount Sinai. And in Exodus chapter 19, they arrive at Mount Sinai. And in Exodus 20, God begins to give Moses the law. And so he had given him the law in the last few chapters, and he'll do more things about the tabernacle in verse 25. But here now he says, uh, he comes down from the mountain, he tells them all the words of the Lord, and that's what they say. Uh, all the words which the Lord has said will we do. Amen. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, here it is again, all that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Amen. Let's get and pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. Yes. I pray as I get Amen. forth this message that you'd help me tonight. Nothing. Please fill me with your yes. spirit. Remove any distractions from this room and from our minds. And as we think of the Bible, Lord, I, I pray you'd give us a burden and a desire, a strong desire, to do exactly what these Israelites said to Moses, to do all the things that you told us to do. So bless the message, use it for your glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. And again, we're looking at two verses here as kind of our springboard into the message. Verse 3, which the, again, we read the people saying all the words of the Lord. Uh, again, which, I'm sorry, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. And again, repeated uh, in verse 7. And so tonight what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a message really concluding this series on bibliology. Uh, dealing with the subject of biblical authority, the authority of the Bible. Amen. Now, I believe we've come to the place where we recognize that the King James Bible is the preserved words of God for English-speaking people. I hope Amen. if you've been in the uh, uh, midweek services that you've learned that, and maybe you knew it already, so maybe just solidified what you already have known but we've learned that, and it's true. And that is because we, we would say also that all other so-called versions would be, uh, in reality, perversions. Right. And the reason we say what we say is primarily because of two things, two reasons we would say what I just said. First is because of the underlying text. Right. You see, the underlying text that the modern versions use to translate from are corrupt. And we understand that, the corrupt Ben Asher text for the Old Testament, also known as the abridged Masoretic text, uh, put out, introduced in 1937 uh, with between 20 and 30,000 suggested changes uh, using 19 different things to change or so-called correct the traditional Masoretic text, and we know that that is a corrupt text. Right. And then the corrupt text of the New Testament is the corrupt Westcott and Hort text, uh, also known as the eclectic text or the Nestle Allen text that was introduced in 1881 with 9,000 in the New Testament, 9,700 Greek word changes that amounts to over 45 pages of scripture that have been changed in the New Testament. And so the first reason we would say that all the other, all modern versions other than the King James, which is not a modern version, uh, but they're corrupt because of the underlying text. Right. 
Uh, then we would say also because of the translation method that those versions use. Not only did they start with a corrupt text, but they translated using what's called dynamic equivalence, or essentially it would be paraphrasing. And so what they did was they added to the words of the text. They subtracted words from the text. They inserted the words of the translators instead of using, like the King James Bible translators use, uh, verbal equivalents and formal equivalents, uh, which translates to very words and forms of the words that God gave to us. And that's what the King James Bible used uh, as opposed to dynamic equivalents. So we would say, no, we reject those because of the underlying text and because of the translation method. We also learned that as we read our Bible, that it is the work of the Holy Spirit of God uh, to illuminate the Scriptures to us. Talked about that as well. In other words, it's the Spirit of God that brings understanding to the mind as we read uh, the Word of God. That we can only understand God's Word by a work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, and we find that uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Amen. So we don't understand the Bible because of our intellect, our intelligence, right. or our education. It is a work of the spirit of God. Right. And so we, we get that. So we, we have God's word, and God's word is illuminated to us uh, uh, by the spirit of God. But my question tonight is this, does the work of God's word in the heart of man end there? Here's what I mean. Does it end with you and I merely having the word of God and also understanding the word of God? Is that where it ends? No. It goes further. Amen. But you know, for many Christians, that is where it ends. You see, there's many Christians who would say, yes, preacher, I believe that the King James Bible is God's words, God's preserved words for English-speaking people. Amen. And they would even say, and I understand what it says. And when you preach, I get it. Uh, but they lack one ingredient, uh, the one ingredient, I should say, that will make all of us complete uh, and mature and full of age spiritually. And that one ingredient is obedience. Obedience. You see, for many Christians, the Bible never truly becomes their authority. They can nod at it, give it lip service, and shake their head and amen to the preaching, and say, oh yes, I believe the King James Bible, talk all about the cover, and say, yeah, I understand what it says, but when it comes to making it their authority, many of God's people don't do that. Don't do it. Uh, there may be certain areas of our lives, we say, well, yes, that's the, the, the Bible's my authority over here, uh, but what about over here? Right. What about in another area? Amen. Now, we all need help to some degree in this area, right. but the goal is for the Bible to be our authority in every area of our lives, because when it's not, we are hurting ourselves, and we're falling short of what God wants us to be. Amen. And so let's talk about this tonight, this subject of biblical authority. Amen. Let's look first of all, number one, the command of biblical authority. <coughs> there's a command. You know, there's one thing, think about it. It's some people, we, we complicate the Christian life. We really do. It's not that hard. There's really just one thing that God desires out of all of his children, and that is obedience. That's it. That's the one thing he wants from every one of us, making his word our authority. Amen. And you know, obedience is something that every one of his children can do, Amen. and it's something he wants every one of his children to do, right. to obey his word. Right. And, and obedience is not, God doesn't put out his commands and say, well, here it is, like a little buffet line, and you, whatever, you know, if you, if, you can, if you can, you know, do this, that would be nice. No, he gives us commandments, uh, not suggestions. Uh, and obedience is something that our God expects. Right. 
Now he says this again and again in his word. Deuteronomy 13, 4. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. Did everybody understand that? I did. That's really simple. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12. And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, Amen. to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day, watch this, for thy good. Amen. He wants us to obey his word. Uh, 1 Peter 1 and verses 1 and 2, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, watch this, unto obedience. Why did he save us? He saved us to obey him. That's why he saved us. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous... Why did he do that? Why did he save us? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, Amen. who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Right. Now turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I think I'm making my point here Amen. by giving you a lot of verses on this. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look at verse 13. We read, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Amen. Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, right. the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen or can see, uh, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Amen. Simply put, God commands obedience from his children. Right. Now, I understand we're not saved by obedience. I think that's a no-brainer, at least for this crowd, I would hope so. Right. Uh, we're not saved by our works. We're not saved by what we do. But we are saved to obey. Right. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. I won't read that, but we are. Now, certainly a proper obedience, and you might want to jot this down. I, well, no, I think, oh, it is. It's down here. A proper obedience must be done willingly. Right. Not grudgingly. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, I'll do it. That's not what he wants. Right. It's to be willingly, not grudgingly, not mechanically. Right. Well, this is what I'm supposed to do, and I want everyone to see. I don't want them to think I'm a bad Christian, or I don't want to get in trouble. So I, I, I guess I'll do it. Well, praise the Lord. You're going to get blessed for that. No, you won't. It has to be willing, uh, not mechanical. It has to be from the heart and not from the head. A and we should obey without reservation and without hesitation. We should obey immediately. Uh, immediately. 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments, watch this, are not grievous. So I ask you tonight, are you happily keeping the commandments of the Lord? Good. When you have to read a standard or see something that says, you say, well, I guess I'll have to do it, you know. Or are you doing it joyfully? Right. You see, obedience is rooted in a proper view of God. Amen. It really is. Right. Uh, true obedience that is willing, willing and uh, from the heart and not mechanical comes out of somebody who has a proper view of God. You see, when you and I have a proper view of God, then obedience will be easy. Right. Now go back to quickly to Isaiah chapter 6. I wasn't going to go there, but we'll go there. Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, we all know, we talked about it in missions conference a little bit here and there. I think uh, 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 Brother Magnard preached about it in chapel, about laborers for the harvest, you know. Here am I, send me. What would prompt somebody to do that? Right. I'll tell you what would, a proper view of God. Amen. Isaiah chapter 6, in the year, verse 1, that King Uzziah died. Notice, here's the view. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. 
Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, notice a proper view of God brings a proper view of self. Then said I, woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Jesus. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Amen. Send me. You see, when we truly see God for who he is, when we see him as the almighty creator, the one who created all of us, uh, the one who knows everything, he knows the beginning from the end, the one who loves me with an everlasting love, and he knows what is best for me, and he wants what's best for me, when I understand all those things about God, obedience will be easy. I'll say, certainly I'll do what you say. You have my best interest. You see, it's a matter of faith. Amen. Just believe in God. Amen. You see, when we hear or we learn a truth from the Bible, we're not given that truth. It's not illuminated to us by God, just merely to expand our intellect or to have a deeper understanding of things or to simply know more. With that knowledge comes a responsibility to obey it. That's why he gave us the truth. That's why he illuminated it to us. So that we do it. When that ingredient is missing, we'll have a lot of problems in our Christian life. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte was rising to power. He attempted to take Egypt, which the British occupied at the time. On August 1st and 2nd, 1798, the British fleet met, uh, met the French fleet in what was called the Battle of the Nile. Now, before the battle began, the, be the commander of the warship, the warship was called the Orient, and the commander placed his 13-year-old son on duty and commanded him to stay at his post until you're relieved by my order. That's what he said. Don't move until I tell you to. Well, soon after the boy was placed there, the battle began to rage, and, and the boy's father was killed. And the boy held his post in the midst of the whole thing. He wasn't moving in the carnage. He didn't know his father had died. And while other sailors were jumping ship, deserting the burning and sinking ship, uh, he was crying out, Father, Father, may I go? May I go? And he never heard his voice. And he died that day, perishing in the flames, because he didn't want to disobey his father. Well, imagine if we had that attitude towards our Heavenly Father. Oh, I won't go there for time's sake, but one time soon read uh, Jeremiah chapter 35 and the story of the Rechabites who were obedient to their father and God used them as an example to Israel saying, look at these Rechabites. They obey what their father said that they won't budge uh, an inch, but you won't obey your heavenly father. Why not? Uh, where are the Rechabites, he says. We're commanded to obedience, number one. Number two, let's consider the confusion of biblical authority. So the command of biblical authority, the Bible should be and must be our authority. Amen. But there's conf some confusion out there. I want to show you what confusion we face. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, a familiar story. This is the chapter, one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. I don't know why. This in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, just uh, you want to see what man is like, the heart of man is like, and man's fallen nature is like. Just, just look how uh, Sam, uh, Saul here and Adam and Eve respond when they get caught, you know. And, and here uh, in 1 Samuel 15, we know that God had instructed uh, 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 Saul in verse 3, now go, and through Samuel, go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And we know it's a simple uh, uh, command, and we know what happened. Look down in verse 
faith, he didn't do it. He was told to do something. Uh, God gave him something. He told him something. And in verse 8, and he took Agag, the king of the Am Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the, the edge of the sword. Uh, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and, and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, they, that they destroyed utterly. So again, he didn't do it. He didn't do what he was told. And, and so God sent Samuel the prophet to, uh, to confront him, and he does in, in, in verse 10 and 11. And and he, he, he confronts him about his disobedience. Uh, and notice how he responds uh, uh, to it, uh, Saul does, in verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Well, what, what do you mean you performed the commandment of the Lord? Saul was confused about something that we see a lot of people today confused about as well. Let me give you an example. Years ago, I, I was talking to a woman, of course, about the, the Lord's salvation. It was on a, I believe it was on a Saturday. And, and she made this statement to me. I never forgot it. She said this, Your authority is the Bible. Amen. My authority is God. That's what she said. Your authority is the Bible. No, mine's God. You see, she was confused about the same thing Saul was confused about. Let me explain. Real simple, real simple, not difficult here. God is the final authority for all mankind. Amen. He's God. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's connect the dots. We know Jesus is God, right? So right. Jesus is God. Therefore, Amen. Jesus Christ is the final authority for mankind as well. So God, Jesus, is the final authority. So since the Bible is God's words right. and God's so written a, a revelation of himself to mankind, then the Bible is the final authority. Right. It's really that simple. Now, I know this may sound simple, but he, here it is. You cannot disconnect God from his word. Amen. But we do it all the time. God Saul did it here. Right. Look at what Samuel said to him in verse 22. Familiar verses, I know. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. God says that disobedience, again, disobedience to God is disobedience to his word. Same thing. It's as, it's rebellion. It's as the sin of witchcraft. Right. It's as the sin of idolatry. Of course, last night was all the weirdness of Halloween around. A lot of creepy things, if you ask me. Right. Witchcraft. Right. All those things. Necromancy, all that stuff. God says that, 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 uh, disobedience is just as is the same thing as, as witchcraft and idolatry. Now here's what I'm trying to say tonight. Many Christians have convinced themselves that they can disobey God's word and still be right with God. That I can be right with God even though there's certain things that I am just, I just, I'm not doing those things. But I'm right with God. You're confused. Right. Just like Saul was here. Now let, let's just think about for a moment what we call the basics of the Christian life. Basic, simple things that God commands us all to do. Read your Bible. Amen. Praise right? The Lord. Uh, pray. Right. Uh, tithe. Right. Basics, right? Amen. Giving, tithing, uh, attending church services, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, uh, witnessing. Those are things right. that are commands to us. Amen. Now I didn't, I didn't make them up. I, I'm just told to preach them. Amen. Okay? And, you know, you get in a lot of trouble sometimes when you just preach those simple things. Right. But that's what he's told us to do. And so if we're not doing those things, we're not right with God. Right. That's right. That's right. Then we can't say the Bible's my authority. That's right. At least not in that area. Right. It's not. Right. You see, many Christians can live in disobedience, and do live in disobedience and rebellion to the simple commandments of God's word and claim to be in fellowship with God. 
In fact, there's sometimes, you know, as a pastor, you just know the things. You know what people do and they don't do. And you, and you hear a message, maybe during a message conference or something that I may preach. Not, I don't aim at anybody, but sometimes, you know, boy, I know this could be a help to somebody. And, and, and they don't respond at all to it. And you're wondering, wow, I would have hoped that that would have been a help. But what's going on? You see, God has to enlighten our minds to things that we, that we or show us that, look, if I am not doing this, then I can't say that the Bible is my authority in that area of life. Right. Amen. Don't be confused. Right. Number one, the command of biblical authority. Number two, the confusion of biblical authority. Number three, the combat against biblical authority. So again, here we are. God says, okay, obey what I say, do what I say, sure. And then I have to, okay, if I obey God, I have to obey his word. But understand something. There is a great battle that's going on here in this area. There is a warfare going on, a spiritual warfare that has been going on with mankind since Genesis chapter 3. Since that old serpent showed up in the Garden of Eden and he tried to woo and succeeded at wooing Adam and Eve away from biblical authority. And he's still doing the same thing today. He's trying to woo, the devil is trying to woo me and you away from biblical authority. It is a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities, against powers, uh, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So notice, uh, if you would, on the back, letter A, there is a war, first of all, over the souls of men. Right. The devil does not want anyone to be safe. 2 Corinthians 2, I'm sorry, 4, verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them uh, that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of, of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine Amen. unto them. Uh, again, Satan's goal is to derail God's eternal plan for mankind, and that is salvation. So what does he try to do? He tries to blind the minds and succeeds, and blinding the minds of men so they don't get saved. But there's another warfare going on. You say, well, preacher, I got saved. Well, that's good. You're still in the war. There is a war also over the minds of Christians. Over your mind. Let me read you something here. 1 Peter 4.1. 1 Peter 4.1. Give me a second here. I wasn't going to read it, but I'll read it. Uh, for, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. So we are to arm ourselves with the same mind, the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, who did always what his Father wanted him to do. The, the Bible was his authority. And so there's this warfare for your mind and my mind. Right. That we would not make the Bible our authority, right. but instead we would listen to the lies of Satan. Lord have mercy. Because there's a lot of them out there. God you see, there's really one of two ways that you and I can live our lives. We can live believing and submitting to God's truth. Amen. John 17, 17, thy word is truth. Jesus is the truth or believing and submitting to Satan's lies. Now remember, the devil is the father of lies, John chapter 8 and verse 44. He wants to discourage you. He wants to, uh, he, he wants to hinder your service for God. He, he wants to destroy your life. He wants to make you and me ineffective for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he does that by making us choose to remove ourselves from being under the authority of God's word and do our own thing, and go our own way. He does this by trying to get us to believe a lie. Uh, you see, believing a lie is the result of accepting a thought that Satan has substituted for God's truth. Let me see if I can give you an example. Let's say something happens in your life, something 
troublesome, difficult, uh, an illness, maybe a family problem, maybe a wayward child, maybe you're going through marital difficulties or financial problems. And uh, understand, as you and I go through those things, because that's a part of life, that's a part of things that happen, uh, understand how you and I interpret that, think about that, and react to that is critical to our spiritual well-being. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And you're going to respond in one of two ways. You're going to either respond by faith, believing what God says, right. or you're not going to believe what God says. You're going to believe the lies of the devil. Do you remember in, uh, I, I preached this message years ago. I called it Between Two Mountains. And... Uh, that message helped me, you know, our own messages help us when we're studying, they really do. But in Deuteronomy 27, do you remember how when God instructed them, when they were coming into the land, that they would go and they would have the two mountains, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. You remember that? When they got into the land and they were to put, uh, uh, put the blessings on Mount Gerizim and they were to put the cursings on Mount Ebal. They would put six tribes in this mountain and six tribes in this mountain. And one would pronounce all the blessings for obeying God's word. And on the other side, these would pronounce all the cursings for disobeying God's word. And by the way, it's a very picturesque thing because Mount Ebal had no growth on it at all. It was like a dead mountain, and that was the cursings of God. And the idea of that was that that's me and you. We stand between those two mountains as we go through life. We have the devil and his lies crying out to us, come on over here. And the devil saying, no, the blessings are over here. The cursings are over there. Don't go over there. And you and I have to choose. We're in between these two mountains. Who are going to believe? Right. Amen. God's word and, his, and make it our authority? Praise the Lord. Or the lies of the devil? God forbid. Now, what does Romans 8.28 say? We could all probably Amen. quote it. We know that all things work together for good Amen. to them that love God, right. to them who are the called according to his purpose. So, so we know that according, right? And we're going through a trial. We're going through a difficulty. Right. And, and we, we think about that. But if we turn from that truth and believe the lies of the devil... Who whispers to us, well, if God loved you, then why would he let that happen to you? you you're, you're serving God and you're in church. And, and look, at, look at the God you serve. Yeah, he doesn't love you. He's not good to you. God's way is not the best way. And you and I have to choose. Amen. We're going to make the Bible our authority? Praise the Lord. Or the lies of the devil? You see, believing Satan's lies will move us out of God's will. Always. Believing Satan's lies will, will make your life an emotional mess. Right. It'll cause you to miss God's blessings. Right. It'll cause you to miss God's purpose for your life. Listen, God do, uh, does not promise to explain everything in this life. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the faith life. We are simply to take him at his word. Amen. But understand, as we go through this, there's a battle going on. And we have the world out there that's crying out, no, this way's better than God's way. Come this way. Uh, uh, we're in a, in a battle zone here. And the question is, who are we going to believe? Good. Who are we going to believe? Praise the Lord. Are we going to continue to make the Bible our authority? Amen. Or listen to the world, the flesh, and the devil and destroy our lives? So we see the command of biblical authority. We see the confusion of biblical authority. We see the combat against biblical authority. And then lastly, the consequences of biblical authority. You know, the devil always says, come on this way. You'll have a great time. And you know what? You may for a little bit. But it doesn't last. It never does. There's pleasure in sin for a season, but the season ends. Right. Amen. And so learn it as early as you can in your Christian life that making the Bible your authority is the very best thing that you and I can do. Stop listening to the world. Stop looking at the world. Look to God and His Word. Trust Him. Believe Him. And do what He says. And you're going to find your life's going to be a whole lot better. In fact, you'll have that abundant life that the Lord Jesus Christ promised. 
What are some, and notice, there are certain things that God promises if we submit to biblical authority. The first one is this, joy. Joy, 1 John 1, 4. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Amen. You know the most miserable person on the face of the earth is, is a disobedient, rebellious child of God. Right. Just look at their face. It's just, it's, 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 it's listen, the devil will, will chew you up and spit you out and then laugh at you. That's what he does. And, and understand, and, and by the way, there's some Christians that may be even in church that don't seem to have a whole lot of joy. Well, maybe it's because uh, you might be doing things mechanically. You're just doing it because, you know, well, this is what I got to do. And you're not rejoicing because you forgot who God is and why he's given us these commands. It's for our good. So we might have the abundant life. Right. And when we submit to his authority, his word, that's where we have the joy he wants right. us to have. Amen. And then letter B, write it down. We also have freedom. Go over, to, go over to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. You know, the devil says, he says, you don't live the Christian life. That's no fun. All those rules. You'll be in bondage. You can't be free. You can't do what you want. You ever hear somebody that, that rebels against the things of God, and for a little bit they say, I'm free. I'm free from all that. Well, then they soon find out they're really not free. Because there's bondage in sin, right. not freedom. Amen. John 8, look at verse 31 and verse 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Notice, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. I, I don't feel bound by standards, do you? I, I don't feel bound. Like I'm, I, I'm glad for them. I need them. Right. Because God loves me, and he, he wants to protect me. And so, again, I have that freedom. Again, it's the exact opposite of what the devil says. Sin brings bondage, and obedience brings freedom. It brings liberty. Amen. Galatians 5, 1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Right. Amen. So we have joy as we submit to his word, freedom. We also have, letter C, peace. It's never fun to walk around with a guilty conscience. Right. There's no peace there. Right. When there's something you're doing or I'm doing in my life and it's not confessed to God and it's there, there's no peace there. There's nothing but turmoil. Jesus said, John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Acts 24, 16, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Isn't it great to have a clear conscience? Right. Amen. And you only have a clear conscience when you have the Bible as your authority right. and you're walking with God. Amen. Then there's a, there's a fourth thing that biblical authority brings, not only joy, freedom, and peace, but also unity. You know, people say that having a Bible standard causes division. Wrong. That's not true. Right. Uh, actually, not having a Bible standard caused, causes division. Amen. You see, it's really simple. A unity is produced as all of us submit to the Bible. Right. Guess what? We all are united. Because the Bible's our authority. We have a question. It's not about what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? It's about what does the Bible say? And as we submit to the Bible, guess what? There is that unity. You see, the liberals are trying to produce some sort of false unity without submitting to biblical authority. It'll never happen. Because the only place you find unity as, is as we submit to the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 1.10. I'll read that to you. Uh, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. How do we do that? By being submitted to the Word of God. Amen. What do I do in this situation? Submit to whatever God says. If you have to forgive, you have to forgive, and so forth. You see, division in a church, division in a home, comes from those who don't want to obey the Bible. They're the ones causing the division. Right. Because they're not submitting. Amen. And then there's one last thing, letter E. 
and that is this confidence. Right. You see, the person who submits himself to the Word of God learns that God's promises are true. And we have confidence in his word. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 26. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. How can we be so bold when we preach and teach and, and take our stand for things? It's because we, we believe that the Bible is God's inspired, preserved words. Amen. We have it. He illuminates it to us. And it's our authority. Therefore, I can with confidence say, Amen. that's right and that's wrong. And that's not what we should do, and that's what we should do. Right. How can we have such confidence? Because God has given me a book right. of which Jesus said, Thy word is truth. truth. Amen. So I ask you tonight, I know all of us have a little bit of growing in this area, but what area in your life and in my life is there that we are kind of excusing away Amen. and not submitting to biblical authority? What is it? Witnessing, Amen. tithing, Amen. faithfulness to church. Amen. Well, I, I, you, know, you don't understand my sin. Amen. Please. Right. God said obey it. Right. Amen. And we can. It's a matter of the will. Right. Are we willing to? Good. You see, we're trying, we have this idea, if I do it my way, I'm going to have more joy and more peace. You're not. Right. Amen. We're, trying to, we're trying to get all those things that God promises without submitting to his word. There's right. only one way to get it. That's and good. that is submitting Amen. to biblical Praise authority. So I ask you tonight, we're going to close right here. What's your excuse? We have God's word. We know God's word. The last step is to obey God's word. Amen. It's that simple. Right. It's that simple.